If you are able and if you are willing, will you pray with me? Ineffable creator who from the treasures of your wisdom created the universe and marshaled the forces of the world with such artful skill. As morning breaks, we come in gratitude that we have reached this day. We are thankful for all who have ushered us here, professors, preceptors, patients, family, friends. By action, by word, by example, by encouragement, we are grateful for those who have brought us to this day. And we pause to remember those whom distance or perhaps death separate us today. Source and inspiration of the healing arts as we come to celebrate the culmination of many long years and sleepless nights of study and arduous work, grant us the joy to honor and celebrate the making of new doctors. We pray that this day will mark the beginning of fruitful and blessed careers and the continuation of these healing arts. Pour into these new doctors generosity, patience, equanimity, compassion, that they may serve at the bench, at the bedside, and at their desks, that they may work to create a world that is more whole, that is more healthy, that is more happy, that is more compassionate. Give us the joy and the honor to celebrate this day and to remember that these doctors will carry with them throughout their lives the gifts that have been given to them this day. Amen. Be seated. Good morning, and welcome to the 45th commencement exercises of the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. First, I want to thank the families and the loved ones of the graduating class for joining us today. Congratulations on everything that you have done that has allowed your medical student to get through four grueling years and be on the launching pad of a wonderful, fulfilling career. You should be very proud of their accomplishments, and I might add, very proud of your own accomplishments in the process. I also want to thank the medical faculty and the staff that are here today. You have played a major role in developing these young physicians. Without your guidance, mentorship, and wisdom, they would not be where they are today. To the class of 2018, we are immensely proud of you. You have worked hard, and I might add, played hard. You've done a great job, and you've accomplished wonderful things. You are wonderful people with immense knowledge, immense compassion, and a true commitment to serve, 
and we are thrilled that you have reached this point in your careers. You are about to go forward into one of the most wonderful professions in the world. You will be entrusted with the caring of the sick and for the less fortunate. In addition, people will come to you for help and in the process tell you their most intimate secrets. Take this responsibility seriously. Never waver in your commitment to improving the lives of your patients and the societies they come from. Also listen to your patients. They have immense insights and a very, very important story to tell you. Now, every commencement speaker wants to leave the podium having conveyed a number of important messages. I am no different, and it's very rare for me to have all the students paying attention, cell phones are off, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. So this is a, a point that I will take advantage of, and there are four points that I want to make today for the graduating class. Point number one, remember where you came from and who helped you get there. At events like this, I cannot help but flash back to my graduation from medical school. I was very excited, my parents were very excited, but probably the most exciting person in the room was my grandmother. My grandmother grew up in Greek Macedonia and was a single mother of two young boys. She never had a chance to go to school, let alone go to college uh, or medical school. During immensely difficult times, she took my uncle and my father to the port city of Patras and took a tramp steamer to New York City. When she got to Ellis Island, she realized that the majority of the island was a big hospital. It was a hospital that was designed to detect communicable diseases, and she also learned very quickly that if you had anything that even remotely looked like a communicable disease, you got sent back to the old country. Unfortunately, my father had developed a rash during their uh, steerage class uh, trip to New York City. So my grandmother dealt with it. She sent my uncle through the line for his examination, which he passed very heartily. She then took my uncle's papers, gave them to my father, put my father under her skirt, <laughs> gave my father's papers to my uncle, and sent him in the line again for a second physical exam. <laughs> he was just as healthy as he had been 10 minutes earlier. <laughs> when this was done, my grandmother had two sons, two sets of health documents, and off they went from Ellis Island into the Lower East Side to start a new life. They worked very, very hard. My grandmother worked in the sweatshops while my father and my uncle went to school. At my graduation, the first person I saw when I came down off the podium was my grandmother. I put my mortar board on her head and she gave me that bear hug hug that only grandmas know how to give you. She then had tears in her eyes and she looked at me and she said, you may be a doctor, but I'm a professor. I'm a professor of life. And you know, she was right. Without my grandmother's ingenuity, without her cunning and her commitment, I would not have had the opportunities that I have had today. And each and every one of you have a similar story about people who helped you get to where you are now. You need to honor these people by thanking them, but you also need to honor these people by paying it forward to the next generation. Point number two that I want to make is that it is time for you to truly, truly find your passion. Now, many of you think that with four years of medical school completed that your days of heavy lifting are over. I hate to say it, but that's not the case. When you become interns and residents, you start on a treadmill of scientific, experiential, personal, and interpersonal learning. You will have immensely varied opportunities over the days and weeks and months to come. The trick is over the next few years to find out what makes you happy and what makes you complete. You need to wake up every morning when you come downstairs and realize that you're about to go outside and do X, whatever X is for eight, 10, 12 hours that day, X ought to put a smile on your face. If it puts a smile on your face, you've used your time here at the Warren Alpert Medical School appropriately, and you've used your time in residency uh, appropriately. Point number three, it is essential that you make medicine better. 
I strongly believe it is the obligation of every physician to improve the care that we provide for future generations and to have better treatment and treatment systems than we have today. At graduations such as this, I can't help but think of a patient that I had when I was an intern named Nick D'Alessandroni. Nick had pulmonary fibrosis. Telling him that he had a disease with no known cause, no known treatment that was going to kill him was extremely hard for both of us. Watching him not respond to the ineffective treatments of that day, including drugs such as Cytoxan, Imuran, Penicillamine, uh, and eventually suffocate changed me forever. I took Nick's death as a challenge, and I spent a good bit of my time as a professional trying to come up with new treatments for diseases, uh, particularly lung diseases. Others have worked very, very hard to improve the operational approaches and the cost efficiency of the care that we provide for our patients. The key thing here is that, that there are still untreatable diseases. I'm sure you can therefore understand why many of us had tears in our eyes when about three years ago, the first drug for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis received Food and Drug Administration approval, and you can understand the thrill that came when some of the drugs that we worked on were taken uh, into the clinic. The last point that I wanna make for you today is I want you to know that you should follow your instincts and do what's right. If in the future you find yourself in a position where you have a vision of what is right and you cannot get popular buy-in, I want you to think about Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, who lived in Europe in the 18, middle of the 1800s. Semmelweis was an obstetrician, and he studied a disease called purpural fever. At that time, in, in the uh, obstetrical wards in Europe, there was a 35% mortality among young mothers. Semmelweis realized that this mortality could be decreased if you simply washed your hands in a chlorinated lime solution. What was very interesting is that Semmelweis thought he was going to be hailed as a hero. Instead, Semmelweis was the brunt of vicious criticism from self-righteous physicians who thought that they were beyond criticism. I don't tell you a sad story like this at the end of the talk to leave you sad. There is a great side to this story, and that is the legacy of Dr. Semmelweis. Dr. Semmelweis not only turned out to be true, his contention was later the basis for the germ theory promulgated by Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister and became the forerunner of modern infectious diseases. Dr. Semmelweis contributed to the health and welfare of millions and millions of people. When I first came to Brown, one of the things I was asked by the graduates was, what are the main points you wanna to convey to our students? Well, here is my answer. We owe it to our patients to provide them with the best care we possibly can. We also owe it to future generations to make our modes of care more efficient and to develop, ameliorate, and I'm going to say it, yes, even prevent or cure diseases that are presently untreatable. So I wanna end this presentation by challenging each and every one of you to do something special for at least one disease during the course of your career. Exactly what type of contribution that will be will depend on where your passion is. It can take place in the clinic, it can take place at the bench, it can take place in the computer terminal, it can also take place with a passionate, dedicated physician who is listening intently to their patient and hears something that others haven't that helps them figure out what is actually going on in that particular patient. Imagine how great this world would be if every Brown student did that, and I know you will. Now take it up one notch. Imagine how great this world would be if every medical student did that during the course of their career. So in closing, congratulations once again to the graduates, to your families, to your loved ones, to the professors, and the Warren Alpert Medical School staff. Go forth and do great things. However, remember, when you are on your life's journey, you will always be part of Brown and the Warren Alpert Medical School family, and we will always be there for you. Go out and celebrate. You've earned it. Thank you.
Welcome, faculty, fellow graduates, family, and friends. I remember the first time I met Dean Tunkel. It was in November of 2014 at Linkage Day, a day in which prospective medical students from post-baccalaureate programs come to learn about the medical school. A portion of our Linkage Day had been dedicated to the new PCPM program, which was an innovative dual degree program that would begin with MD-19. The school seemed very proud of this program and I personally found it very exciting. So I saw Dean Tunkel at the reception and decided he looked non-threatening enough to approach. <laughs> he listened to my enthusiastic description of my background and career interests, thought for a moment and said, yeah, it's not for you. <laughs> I was simultaneously taken aback, but also so impressed with his honesty, candor and insight. He was, of course, completely right. And that was my introduction to the omniscient being who is Dean Allen R. Tunkel, MD, PhD, MACP, FIDSA. <laughs> dean Tunkel is what I like to call our daily dean. He is always present and always available, whether it's for impromptu advice while he's in line for lunch at Bagel Gourmet, hosting his frequent Lunch with the Dean events to get our input and feedback on the medical school, and occasionally on his daughter's tattoo choices, or appearing in random student group photo ops, sometimes rather strangely wearing a short white coat. He knows every student in every year by name. Not only that, he knows our career interests, research interests, personal interests, and the names of our parents and children. He has a true open door policy, and I know one of his greatest joys is in helping to guide us through the fascinating, unique experience that is medical education. I personally have abused this privilege. When he found out that I was interested in a career in infectious disease, which is his clinical area of expertise, he became my de facto advisor. I found my research mentor through Dean Tunkel, talked through career paths with Dean Tunkel, celebrated my first publication with Dean Tunkel, and did my match list with Dean Tunkel. I am delighted to have matched at his first choice. <laughs> As we move on to residency, we are forever better for the individual and school level leadership, mentorship, support, and presence of Dean Tunkel. How fortunate are we that not only do we have a world-renowned physician and researcher as our very own daily dean, but he is also so dedicated to teaching that he spends the wee hours of his mornings Googling images of jars of Klebsiella's homemade red currant jelly as a memory aid for a potential pathogen and classic clinical manifestation of pneumonia in persons with alcohol use disorder. <laughs> to my fellow graduates, when the nights are long and you are, once again, deeply questioning your life choices, I would encourage you to call upon our best friend, Dr. Up to Date, and pull up the bacterial meningitis article authored by our very own Uncle Tunkel. <laughs> there is so much more that I could say, but the clock is ticking. For in his last act of dedication to MD-19, Dean Tunkel is here speaking at our graduation while his own daughter is at this very moment graduating with her undergraduate degree from Brown. Please welcome our beloved Dean Tunkel. I haven't even said anything yet. Maybe you, you want to wait and see if you like what I'm about to say. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Kelly, for those, those beautiful remarks. Uh, 
Uh, they really mean very much to me. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak at your graduation ceremony today. Really, probably one of the most wonderful honors in my life. And this was a difficult speech for me to write because I wanted to be sure that my remarks would have some impact on your roles as future physicians. So I decided to talk with all of you from my perspective as a patient, a view from the bed, so to speak, as I had a personal experience in dealing with a potentially fatal illness, or one that definitely would have been fatal to me without rapid and appropriate treatment. So at the time, I was 62 years old, and the date was March 17, 2017. And I remember that date really well because it was match day. And I was feeling very well during the festivities, really enjoyed the ceremony, <clears throat> excuse me. And then mid-afternoon, I noted some muscle aches, really no other symptoms, although they kept returning despite analgesics. So that night, there was a dinner program at the Biltmore Hotel in Providence uh, to kick off a weekend symposium at the medical school that was entitled the patient, the practitioner, and the computer. And the theme was how the electronic health record has impacted communication between patients and physicians and might also make physicians less humanistic. So as one of the people who supported the symposium, I was asked to give some opening re remarks, and I took the opportunity of talking about a personal experience that I had had with the electronic health record about five years earlier. So at the time, I was chair of the Department of Medicine at a teaching hospital in New Jersey, and I'd just been diagnosed with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. I was pretty sick at the time, needed to be urgently admitted to my hospital for chemotherapy. Now, you would think that this diagnosis in and of itself was an anxiety-producing event, but there was another issue and one that gave me even greater concern. This was the week that my hospital was rolling out their electronic health record. <laughs> <clears throat> So it was, a, it was a chaotic time. Everyone was being trained on how to use it. Would I be able to survive? Uh, of course I did. I got all the right medications. There were no errors in my care. I also responded very well to the chemotherapy. I remain cancer-free now, uh, now after almost seven years. <clears throat> so I decided to tell the audience of the conference about one particular experience regarding the hospitalization, because after a discharge, I, of course, decided to go into my hospital record to review my chart. So on my initial history, there was a question. The question was pregnancy. And the box checked was patient denies. <laughs> now, that's actually an issue on two levels. The first, you know, I hope, is the obvious one. But the second is that no one ever asked me if I was pregnant. And this highlights a potential issue with the electronic health record. I'm going to talk get back to this a little bit later. But now back to March 17, 2017 at the Biltmore. So about 30 minutes after my remarks during the keynote, I started feeling lightheaded, was sweating, a little nauseated, definitely feeling like I was about to pass out, so hurried out of the banquet hall into the lobby. I didn't lose consciousness but fell to the floor, and I just thought it was some sort of vasovagal response, not sure to what. I think people attending the keynote noticed something was wrong, and a number of the doctors followed me out. So I, I, if you're going to pass out, the best place to do it, by the way, is at a medical conference. <laughs> so my pulse was difficult to palpate, was fast, really no other symptoms. Fire rescue was called after an intervention by Dr. Schiffman, and I was loaded into the ambulance and taken to the ER at Rhode Island Hospital. I, I was feeling fine by that time, still some generalized muscle aches, but really nothing else, no headaches, stiff neck, chest pain, nothing. My only medications were aspirin, and I took Valsartan for hypertension. I'm allergic to kiwi, but I hadn't taken any since 1989. <laughs> uh, no one actually asked me about uh, drug use or sexual activity, probably because they were afraid of what I might say. <laughs> Uh, after all, I was a teenager in the late 1960s. I had received my yearly influenza vaccine the previous November, and I had gotten the pneumococcal vaccine as well. So examine the ER, my temp was 99.9, heart rate 101, respirations 14, my blood pressure was 111 over 72. I, we're we're going to just get into it, so we want to be sure you're prepared for residency. <laughs> My pulse ox was 99% on room air, all essentially normal, although my pulse was a little faster than usual. My lungs were clear, nothing abnormal on my exam. My labs were pretty normal, too, except my white count was up, about 16,000. Chest x-ray, EKG were normal. The emergency room attending came to see me, indicating there did not seem to be any obvious source of bacterial infection or anything else. 
I told her I still didn't feel quite normal, and after some discussion, she decided to admit me with plans to have me monitored and check uh, my lab studies in the morning. Uh, she said there did not seem to be any reason for administration of antibiotics, so since I'm an infectious disease specialist, I concurred. <laughs> the resident was called to do my history and exam. He, did also, he also did not ask me about drug use or take a sexual history, and I was left on the stretcher in the ER, hooked up to the monitor, wearing my blood pressure cuff that would intermittently inflate and deflate. It was around midnight this time, and I decided to try to fall asleep. About 1.30 in the morning, I awoke and put, to turn my head toward the monitor. My pulse was now 130 beats per minute, and my blood pressure was dangerously low at 75 over 50. Now I was febrile, I'm getting short of breath. The oxygen level of my blood had decreased to 92%. I called for the nurse to get the ER physician. It turned out to be Dr. Rugus. He increased, uh, good, yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Rugus. He increased the rate of fluids, ordered a stat CT scan of my chest, abdomen, and pelvis after taking cultures of my blood. Good work, cultures first. He started antibiotics. The CT scan, I, I wouldn't have let him start them without the blood cultures. Living. The CT scan showed a new right lower lobe pneumonia, but was otherwise normal. And after four liters of fluid, my blood pressure was unchanged, still dangerously low. Now I'm sent to the critical care area of the ER where I meet a new group of physicians. The resident places a central line in my right internal jugular vein and adds a drug called norepinephrine to raise my blood pressure. Then I'm set to the ICU because I'm in septic shock. So by the time I reached the ICU at six in the morning, the ICU staff works to get me situated. New labs were drawn my oxygen saturation's dropping, and when my labs returned, I asked my, the nurse for the results. My white count was now 2,600, which is below normal. I remember saying to her, this is not good. <laughs> uh, you know, meaning that my own immune system uh, was being overwhelmed, not doing a great job in helping to control my infection. My other labs were not looking good either. My breathing's becoming more labored. I was placed on high flow oxygen. And I remember saying to my nurse, I thought I was likely going to be intubated and placed on a ventilator. She then said something to me that has stayed with me to this day. She said, Alan, I've been watching people breathe for 27 years, and there's many other things that we can do first. I then got placed on BiPAP to help keep my lungs expanded. Really uncomfortable, by the way. Did the trick. By midday, I'd received nine liters of, of normal saline. My hands were swollen. Norepinephrine was maintaining my blood pressure, but could not be stopped. The Infectious Diseases Service was consulted, probably because I'm a dean, I must have something much more exotic than a simple community-acquired pneumonia. They did not make any changes to my antibiotics, asked me if that was okay with me. I said, that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> so next day, my white count's about 8,100, a lot of bands, my platelets are dropping, again, not good. The residents were in to see me early each day. I now had decreased breath sounds and crackles at the right base on exam of my chest, clear signs of pneumonia. Now, as you all know, I'm an educator, and I suggested that they should check me for something called egophony. And what that is, you put your stethoscope over an area of the lung where there's pneumonia, and you ask the patient to say E, and what the physician hears is a loud A sound through the stethoscope. So I then proceeded to tell them how egophony was discovered. I mean, how did anyone ever figure out when you put a stethoscope on the chest over an area of pneumonia, why do you ask the patient to say E? So whenever questions of this source comes up in the history of medicine, there are three major requirements. A British missionary, <laughs> a far-flung land, and lots of serendipity. So in this case, there was a British missionary named Shibley who in the 1920s was practicing missionary medicine in China. So part of his job consisted of auscultating the chest of patients while they were saying one, two, three. And since the patients were Chinese, the Mandarin dialect for the number one was pronounced E in the province where Shibley was working at that time. So the E turned into an A whenever there was pneumonia. So the residents listened. Uh, nobody ever checked me for agophony. <laughs> and they were probably just thinking about all the other sick patients they needed to see and were ready to move on. During my time in the ICU, many people started coming to see me, and I was very happy when they all stopped by. It certainly was hard to rest. And the weekend was over, my new attending physician said no one except family and my care team was now going to be allowed to come by. I needed to rest. A sign was placed on my door, no visitors except family. Sleeping at night was very difficult. The ICU bed was very uncomfortable. I don't like to take medications, but the resident convinced me to take some uh, Zolpidem, which is Ambien at night. 
and I was sleeping so badly I asked him for the hallucinogenic dose. <laughs> Over the next several days, I started feeling better. The team was able to get me off BiPAP, wean off the norepinephrine. After a week in the ICU, I was transferred to the general medicine unit to complete my antibiotics. Now, a new resident saw me, did her own history. She asked me about drug use and sexual activity. But she was one of our, had been one of our Brown medical students. She knows I would not have liked it if she were not complete. And over the next few days, I began ambulating more, was able to maintain my oxygen saturation. Without supplemental oxygen, I was going to get out of the hospital as quickly as I could. The etiology of my pneumonia and septic shock were actually never determined. However, I'm sure I had pneumococcal sepsis, a classic presentation. So now here comes the reflection part. Uh, I'm going to give you a few, five to be exact. First, getting back to the electronic health record, the hospital chart is not always accurate. So, of course, I looked at my chart again. Seemed to be a few inaccurate dates that got carried over. Seemed to be some copying and pasting. Even in later notes from a week after my admission, some notes indicated that already completed tests were still pending. Or the note from the dietician that I had a cholecystectomy in 1999. As far as I know, I still have my gallbladder. Uh, I did, though, I had a actual, I had a vasectomy in 1999. Well, they're both ectomies, right? Close enough. <clears throat> <laughs> However, on a positive note, in almost every description of me, I was described as a pleasant 62-year-old gentleman. <laughs> and that made me happy, and I think that was accurate. So the message to all of you is to is to be accurate and complete in the health record and rely on information that you personally take from the patient. Second, and with all due respect to everyone else, and of course acknowledging that the approach to a patient's care is a team effort, the nurses are the most important people in the hospital. They spent the most time with me, gave me great care, especially in the ICU. The nurses are the heart and soul of any hospital. And in addition to spending the most time with me, they ensured that through this difficult experience, I was able to maintain my dignity when everything about being in the hospital involves others taking care of your every need and a loss of dignity. And you're going to learn a lot from the nurses and other members of the healthcare team. Ask them what they think and benefit from their knowledge and expertise. Third is that recovery from a serious illness takes a long time. So a friend of mine is head of critical care at the National Institutes of Health, and he sent me a note during my hospitalization. And he made several important points. The first was that physical rehabilitation is a lot harder than it appears in terms of returning to the original state of activity. And to be honest, I did not think it would take months to feel better, but he was right. I should have known this because even for minor activities in the ICU, I needed assistance. I needed help sitting up in bed and two people to pull me up in bed. And for weeks, almost doing all activities was a strain and quite stressful. His second point was that cognitive abilities take weeks or months to recover. I didn't initially believe that either because I was awake and alert throughout my hospitalization, although most certainly had periods of hypotension and hypoxemia. I would say that I was not back to normal for about three to four months. Fortunately, because I'm a dean, I, I have a job that does not require intact cognition. <laughs> right, Dean Elias? Uh, okay, yes. <laughs> Perhaps I was even better at my job. <laughs> of course, I decided not to do any patient care until I was ready. Wound up doing, not doing my inpatient time that was scheduled in June. Fourth, I want to talk about impact on others. So this was my major concern during my hospitalization and relates to my wife's illness. So about 15 years earlier, she was diagnosed with a disease called idiopathic cerebellar degeneration, which has progressed over the years, leaving her wheelchair dependent. On top of that, she's had multiple strokes over the prior three years, which have made the situation even worse. In fact, before my illness, she had spent a week in the hospital, then eight weeks in rehab after her fourth stroke. And I'm her primary caregiver, and need to spend my first day in the ICU arranging for extended home care for her. And that experience, I think, helped me to understand how hospitalizations can disrupt people's lives to a greater extent than I had previously imagined. And my wife, now my health, was my major concern. And I was worried what might happen to her if I did not survive. It really put things into important perspective for me. Finally, were there any positive aspects to all of this? 
Uh, one was that I was overweight. I wound up losing about 15 pounds. It was really embarrassing to look at my chart and see that my body mass index was elevated and it was in red numbers followed by an exclamation point. <laughs> The other positive aspect relates to my family. As you can imagine, my two major illnesses have had a significant impact on them, but also in some positive ways. Our, our family has always been very close. <clears throat> Excuse me, but in many ways, my illnesses have enhanced our relationships. and enriched our lives. So I'm truly fortunate in this regard. We cannot always say the same for many others whose lives have been devastated, who do not have the emotional support they need in order to recover. Unfortunately, throughout your careers, you'll see many patients who do not have the support, and you need to expand the effort to help them through these life-altering events. So this is my main message to you as you move forward in your careers. Enhance the lives of your patients. This may happen at the bench, the bedside, in the community, or through advocacy, or maybe through all of these and more. Your patients will be the better for it. Well, that's all I have to say, and hope this summary of my experiences and reflections were useful. Remember, I will always think of each of you as one of my students, no matter where life takes you. My best to everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful speech, Dean Tunkel. There. <laughs> um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our class speaker, the soon-to-be Dr. Jonathan Staloff. John's journey into medicine began when he was shockingly not accepted into Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, <laughs> and so instead matriculated at the next most magical place, Brown University. <laughs> As an undergrad, he found passion in public health and public policy while affirming his love for clinical medicine by volunteering as an EMT. After college, he continued his public policy passion at a healthcare consulting group before starting at Albert Medical School. While here, he has impressed his classmates with a dazzling knowledge of healthcare systems and acronyms, as well as an infectious enthusiasm for sharing his knowledge with others. He has co-led the Healthcare in America speaker series, co-taught a two-week uh, Fundamentals of Health Policy course and funded Brown Medical Students for the ACA after the 2016 election. He was invited to give a speech at a congressional rally. John's interest in health policy is not distinct from his interest in the more individual, humanistic qualities of medicine. For at its core, policy is medicine at the population level, an attempt to positively influence the health of a population. Through his published writing and efforts in the community, John has grappled with how physicians care for patients at their inner life, how to best support family caregivers, and, ha and how Rhode Island's Medicaid program can address social determinants of health. He was inducted as a member of Albert's cap chapter of the Gold Humanism Society. John will be heading to Seattle to start a family medicine residency at the University of Washington. Go Huskies. Uh, <laughs> our class has nominated John as a class speaker which personally I feel was a pretty great choice. And so please join me in welcoming a gentleman, a scholar, and one of my favorite people, Jonathan Staloff. Wow, she really likes me. <laughs> I've been wondering that for a while now. 
Thank you very much to the always wonderful and very soon to be Dr. Wozniak for such a kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. Are there any soon to be MDs in the room? Oh, yeah. I'd like to thank the incredible Warren Alpert Medical School class of 2019 for the honor of speaking before you today. But first, I have to let you know, despite that honor, I'm going to deeply, deeply disappoint you. First, no one, no one can follow Dean Tunkel. Um, so thank you so much again, and also, why'd you gotta do that to me? <laughs> Second, uh, spoiler alert, I will not be making any dramatic announcements about paying anyone's loans off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Family medicine, Maddie said. <laughs> it is my sincere pleasure to welcome Dean Elias, Dean Tunkel, Alpert Medical School faculty and staff, spouses and partners, families and friends who are joining us here today, as well as those who could not be here but are certainly joining us in thought and in spirit. Today is such an incredible day for the class of 2019 that we've reached this joyous point we owe to all of you who have supported us. You lent us a shoulder when we needed one to lean on. You offered us wisdom when we needed guidance. And you gave us your hearts when we needed encouragement. Most recently, you even shared your curiosity about how our new hobbies and vacations over the past few months actually contributed to our medical educations. <laughs> In all sincerity, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you. How about applause for those people? Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Ma. I'd also like to thank a group of people that have made it possible for all of us to successfully survive medical school, a group that has supported, nourished, and sustained us in our years of learning. Of course, I'm referring to the good people of Brown University Dining Services, Kebab and Curry, Pizza Gourmet and Bagel Gourmet Cafe for all their pizza and non-pizza free lunches these four years. Now that I have my obligatory jokes out of the way, and you've generously given me your obligatory laughs, thank you very much, I'd like to reflect on a question I've grappled with since starting on this path of medicine. That is, in a profession so rooted in healing, what does it mean to heal? When entering medical school, I thought I had a good understanding of this question. I was privileged that my experiences led me to believe that healing was a process with a clear and discernible beginning and end. I remember when in elementary school, when I was sick with strep throat, the doctor healed me with an antibiotic. In high school, when my best friend was in end-stage kidney failure, the doctor healed him with a kidney transplant. In college, when my grandmother had a cancerous tumor on her eye, the doctor removed it and healed her too. I understood that not all that ails us could be healed, for disease will always prove a formidable foe. But for what modern medicine could provide, I found comfort and inspiration in this simple understanding of healing. At the start of this journey, I thought that through learning the knowledge of medicine and mastering those tangible scientific facts, I, too, could become a healer. I, too, could be a physician. I'm sure you won't be surprised to learn that these four years taught me that healing is not always so simple. For many of us, bearing witness to the more complex nature of our, na of our patient's suffering led us to struggle with our respective understandings of what it means to heal. We wondered, how are we healing patients hospitalized for chronic diseases like heart failure? knowing that despite our best efforts, nothing will change the fact that their condition will slowly yet surely worsen. We asked, do we owe more to our patients than prescription medicines and treatment plans when environmental and social systems so strongly influence their long-term health? Or what does it mean to heal patients at the end of their lives when so much of what lays ahead for them and their families is clouded in uncertainty? These are just a few of the questions we've asked ourselves during the last four years as others started to look towards us as healers for the very first time. Standing here today, I now appreciate that the uncertainty of illness does not challenge the notion that we as physicians can help our patients heal. Rather, 
we will heal by choosing to commit ourselves to our patients and joining them in that shadow of uncertainty. We heal by spending long, tireless nights searching for answers to mysterious diagnoses so that morning might bring clarity. We heal through dedicating ourselves to years, decades of research so that the limits of medicine today are the foundations of medicine tomorrow. We heal by standing alongside our patients in each steps of their journeys, no matter what they bring. We heal in celebrating in moments of health, struggling in moments of illness, and mourning when life comes to its end. When under our care, our patients can say, I have a partner. I am not alone. That is what it means to heal. I consider myself so fortunate to call myself your classmate. For over the last four years, your work, your advocacy, and our countless discussions in and out of the classroom have taught me that in our responsibility as physicians to heal, we must also ask what in this world needs healing. You taught me that what impacts the health of our patients does not begin nor end in the walls of our hospitals and clinics, and neither should our roles as physicians. In the brown tradition of questioning tradition, Together, we are building a new understanding of what it means to heal. We understand that when medical science produces groundbreaking treatments, but has not yet found a way to deliver them to the patients who need them most, physicians must ask, does our healthcare system need healing? When communities are forced to ask if their water is safe to drink or if their air is clean to breathe, physicians must ask if our environment needs healing. When the zip code of someone's birth their race, income, gender identity, immigration status, or who they love impacts their health more than any medication that we can ever provide. Physicians must ask if what we consider just in this society needs healing. Even though the causes of social ills are as complex as the human body and the recovery equally uncertain, we must join our communities in this uncertainty and together make real a world that reflects our firm belief that health is a human right. <laughs> Beyond all of this, you have all taught me that what it means to heal and to be a physician is always being rewritten. I'm inspired to know that the future of medicine will be firmly written in the handwriting of the Warren Alpert Medical School class of 2019. It is truly my honor to know you and to call myself a member of this extraordinary community of physicians, this community of healers. Thank you all and congratulations. Graduates, please stand.
is traditional that those about to enter the profession of medicine take an oath before their peers, their faculty, and their families, pledging themselves to certain ethical principles of commitment and professional behavior. This particular oath was written by the MD class of 1975 and has been used by each succeeding class since then. Please repeat after me. Now being admitted to the high calling of the physician, I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life to the care of the sick, the promotion of health, and the service of humanity. In the spirit of those who have inspired and taught me, I will seek constantly to grow in knowledge, understanding, and skill. and will work with my colleagues to promote all that is worthy in the ancient and honorable profession of medicine. The health and dignity of my patients will ever be my first concern. I will hold in confidence all that my patients relate to me. I will not permit consideration of race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, nationality, or social standing. I will not permit consideration of race, gender, sexual orientation, To come between me and my duty to anyone in need of my services. This pledge I make freely and upon my honor. Be seated. Soki E. Anarandi. Omnis quos ad gradum magistri, adoneos comparamus vobis presentamos, et eos ad hunc gradum promovere liciat rogamos. Candidati ad gradum magistri ascendat. Arcturatati mihi comissa vos ad gradum magistri admito omniaque jura a privilegia ad hunc gradum pertinentia vobis concedo quare in testimonium haec diplomata vobis solemnitar grado. Sir, I have the honor to present. Sir, I have the honor to present the recipient of the degree of Master of Public Health of Brown University, Re Garcia Sampson. <laughs> PCPM candidates, please rise and move to the front. Sir, I have the honor to present the recipients of the degree of Master of Science in Population Medicine of Brown University, Gillian Alice Tsao. <laughs> Stephanie Chang. <laughs> Hiba Dunani. Michelle Diop. <laughs> Alexa Canbergs. <laughs> Fez Khan. <laughs> hmm. 
Rani Matuk. <laughs> Elizabeth Perry. <laughs> Matthew Perry. <laughs> Elise Presser. <laughs> Alicia Rowland. Nari Sohn. <laughs> Julia Solomon. <laughs> Jonathan Staloff. <laughs> Austin Tam. Vedete igator ut probe inter Greque in emolumentum rei publicae eun dei honorum ut decet eis eos hoc gradu honoratus. Vos geratus. Sedete magistri. Soci e honorandi, omnes quos ad gradum doctoris medicinae et oneos comperamos, vobus presentamos et eos ad hunc gradum promovere liciat rogamos. Candidati ad gradum doctoris medicinae ascendat. Actoritati mihi commissa vos ad gradum doctoris medicinae ad omniaque iura a privilegia ad hunc gradum pertinentia vobus concedo quare in testimonio hic diplomata vobus solemnitar trato. Sir, I have the honor to present the recipients of the degree of Doctor of Medicine of Brown University. <laughs> Sean Ahmed. Ananya Anan. <laughs> Clarissa Andre. Kaushik Anam. <laughs> Emmanuel Asidu. Maya Ayub. <laughs> Tylon Barreto. <laughs> Mara Benson. <laughs> oh. 
Carl Benz. Kimberly Bowerman. Chelsea Boyd. Mackenzie Brigham. Leon Alice Sal. <laughs> Amber Carduce. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey Carr. Carla Castillo. Stephanie Chang. Rudy Chen. Alexa Choi. Catherine Chicolello. Congratulations. Nathan Coppersmith. Adrian Cotarello. Abigail Davies. <laughs> Heba Danani. Eleanor DiBiazio. Michelle Diop. Anna Depreet. <laughs> Olivia Depreet. <laughs> Kristen Durbin.
Julianne Edwards. <clears throat> Obina Ekakazia. <laughs> Adam El Toron. <laughs> Shane Fishbach. Emily Fu. <laughs> Daryl Gachet. Congratulations. Ree Garcia Sampson. <laughs> Jessica Gardner. Congratulations. Dariushil Gosolkar. Joshna Ghosh. Gianni Glick. Mark Godding. Leslia Gonzalez. <clears throat> John Hammond. Daniel Hashemi. <laughs> Gerald Hefferman. Albert Tang. Hans Uber. Eva Ingram. Alyssa Khan. 
Alexa Canbergs. Faz Khan. Carmen Kilpatrick. <laughs> Justin Kleiner. Walter Kleiss. <laughs> Amy LeCount. Brian Lay. <laughs> Matthew Lee. Yao Lu. Sarah Magaziner. <laughs> Rani Matuk. <laughs> Damon McIntyre. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca Mendelson. <laughs> Kathleen Moriarty. Rhea Murali Tharun. All right. Thank you so much. Diana Nardella. Kira Neal.
<laughs> Natasha Wynn. Xavier Orcutt. <laughs> Oyin Kasola Oshobamiro. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Park. Sarah Park. Elizabeth Perry. <laughs> Matthew Perry. Andrew Killing. <laughs> Andrew Powers. Elise Presser. <laughs> Lindor Chunai. Catherine Rand. <laughs> Pranav Reddy. Leah Rivard. <laughs> Cullen Roberts. Carlos Rodriguez Russo. Alicia Rowland. Salvador Rosales. <laughs> Brian Russell.
Kirsten Sapp. Nicholas Selke. <laughs> Ashish Shah. Aaron Shapiro. Kelly Scrable. Brandon Smith. Nari Sohn. Greta Solinap. Julia Solomon. <laughs> Jonathan Staloff. Danielle Stern. <laughs> Cynthia Susai. Solomon Schwartz. Austin Tam. James Tanch. <clears throat> Elizabeth Tarr. Margaret Thorson. <laughs> 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 
Alexander Tran. <laughs> Tram Tran. Jennifer Sai. <laughs> Eric Tung. Congratulations. Anshu Vaish. <laughs> Fabian Vargas. Ethan Burrell. <laughs> Paul Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Wong. Jing Wang. John Warwick. <laughs> Joe Warzynski. Sarah Weatherall. <laughs> Barrett Weiss. Madeline Wozniak. <laughs> Timothy Wright. Sandra Yan. <laughs> James Yu.
Sir, I wish to report that seven students have completed their degree requirements and have permission to receive their degree in absentia. Alan Atkins, Burke Gao, Gabriel Lupu, Michelle Ko, Nisha Nama, Daniel Wong, and Se Young Yoon. Wedete igator ut probe intergreque in a malamentum rei publicae eundei honorum ut deco eos hoc gradu honoratos vos geratas sedete doctores medicinae. Please stand as you are able. For the God-centered among us, I invite you to join me on calling on some of the divine names as we conclude this ceremony, as I say them in both English and the sacred languages of Arabic and Hebrew. For those with different convictions, I invite you to join me in calling on these names as representing doors to a deeper reality and potential inside of ourselves. In the name of God, all praises you to God, and peace be upon God's messengers. Ya Shafi, Ya Rahmanu, Ya Salamu, Adan Harifu'a, Harachaman, Hamushlam. O healer, O most widely merciful, O wholeness, make our new medical graduates healers who serve as sources of compassion to others and who bring wholeness to their fellow humans. Ya Alimu, Ya Hakimu, Ya Razaku, Al Hadaat, Hamaskil, Hamakayam, O most knowledgeable and wise, O sustainer, grant our new medical graduates everything necessary for them to continue to follow the passions and intentions with which they entered medical school. Ya Adlu, Ya Haku, Ya Rafi'u, Hadayan, Ha Emet, O Hamoshia, O oh justice, O oh truth, O oh uplifter, continue to challenge our new medical graduates to stand for greater equity through the choices they make throughout their careers, to serve the underprivileged, and to build a brighter and more hopeful future for all. We conclude with thanksgiving and deep appreciation to the divine presence and to the human presence of families, friends, administrators, and teachers who have helped us along this way. Amen. <laughs>